Okay, so welcome back to the um, Gibson workshop on fungal communities and their dynamics and interactions with plants. We're going to move into uh, some particular communities, and the first one we're going to look at are, are, is a dung community. And so we'll talk about dung fungi and an ecosystem in a microcosm. So let's go over some general features of all fungal communities first. And the first of these is there has to be an energy source. Um, so typically this is other dead or living organisms that can be digested and provide this energy. So remember, these are not plants. They're not fixing energy from sunlight. Um, conditions have to be favorable for growth. So stressful conditions like um, uh, lack of water or high temperature or something could, could uh, limit which fungi can grow in a particular spot. And we'll see some of this. Um, and fungi have to find this source of energy, whatever it is. In this case that we're about to move into, it'll be dung. So that somehow they've got to figure out how to disperse to that. And in Elsa's introduction, she went through um, many types of spore dispersals. We'll come back to some more specific examples of that. And then finally, in any of these communities, fungi are likely to encounter other species um, that are competitors or parasites or fungivores. Um, and if you are the lucky fungus that shows up early, you have an advantage because you avoid most of these competitors and other species you might interact with. So there's always a premium for getting there fast. So now let's turn to the lovely subject of dung fungi. <laughs> and um, this is our energy source. So in a dung fungal community, um, dung is, is high energy. It's partially digested plant material, and it also has lots of dead and dying uh, microbes that were active in the gut of the, of the uh, animal. And then once they are released from it, the environment has changed dramatically. They're not doing as well, they're dying off. And so their body mass is also um, energy for other fungi. Generally, conditions on dung are conducive to fungal growth, uh, but water or extreme temperature can limit this. And so as dung dries up, uh, everything sort of shuts down. And then when it wets back up, it'll start again. Dung deposits are notoriously unpredictable in uh, time and space that if you were randomly searching the planet for, for dung, it would be a bad strategy. So, the, so fungi have come up with various ways, uh, two in particular that we'll go through, to uh, efficiently find dung and disperse to it. And then once they're there, fungi compete for the dung resource, uh, and the community is rich in other bacteria, microinvertebrates, and mycoparasitic fungi that are also all scrambling for a piece of the pie, so to speak, be it a cow pie in this case. <laughs> so, uh, fungi commonly found on dung are called coprophilus, uh, meaning dung loving. Um, and coprophilus fungi come from all the major groups of, of fungi. Here I'm showing three of those groups. The top uh, two shown up here are, are the mucoromycota, uh, um, little typically uh, microscopic fungi, but they just get into the macroscopic level as a little fuzz on dung. There's also the uh, sac fungi uh, that you heard Elsa talk about, um, and there's several varieties of those that we'll come back to. And then there's also the basidium mycota uh, that make little mushrooms on dung. Um, so some of these fungi are restricted to dung. That is, that's the only habitat you'll find them in where uh, others are also found on, on uh, decaying plant material. So here is pylobolus. We'll come back to pylobolus when we talk about dispersal, but I wanted to bring it up front and center because it is a very common and dung-specific fungus. The only habitat you find this on is uh, herbivore dung. Um, and there are a bunch of others like this that are very particular. Uh, one of them is the genus Sporomiella, and what you're looking at here is a title for a paper uh, about it that shows that it's been 
uh, useful in the uh, fossil record because uh, seeing spores of Sporomiella in quantity in um, like lake beds and things like that shows that there's there was a high density of herbivores. So how can they tell that? Well, uh, the spores of Spromiella are very distinctive. These little Tootsie Roll-like spores are segmented, and the individual segments have this little um, sigmoid scar on them. Uh, and so when these are found in the fossil record in quantity, it's saying that there was a lot of dung around, and to have a lot of dung around, there had to be a big herds of herbivores. So it's it's used as, as a way of looking back in time um, at, at herbivory. There's also uh, predaceous fungi that are common in, uh, in dung, uh, and they're feeding on things other than the dung. So it's a whole community going on here. And so what we're looking at here is uh, Stylopagy um, anomala, which is a um, amoeba feeder. And so what you're looking at in this corner here, the arrows are amoebae that are stuck to the uh, to little sticky spots on the uh, the hyphae of Stylopagy. And then on the uh, right-hand side, you can see uh, these little bubbles of hyphae after the amoeba has been digested, and you just see uh, remnant hyphae. So it's so it's a predator of of amoebae, and it's super common on dung. We'll come back to this one. There's also mycoparasites, and uh, Elsa's introduction again went through through a lot of uh, different types of uh, mycoparasites, but these are fungi that attack other fungi. So in this case, the diagram is of uh, Piptocephalus, uh, which is a mycoparasite on a bunch of the early arriving fungi on dung. Uh, and this diagram shows its little um, infection structures uh, called Hostoria entering into the broader hyphae of its host. And then in the uh, right-hand corner there, you see a scanning electron micrograph of the, of the small hyphae again on top of its host. So again, this is a whole ecosystem on a fine scale. It's such a great ecosystem on a fine scale that it's been one that's been a sort of a model for uh, fungal ecologies since the early 1900s. And there's a long literature uh, from this early work about dung fungi. Um, and if you're interested in this, uh, I refer you to this to this paper by Webster in the 70s, where he summarized a lot of this older work. Um, and Webster was an experimentalist that worked primarily with rabbit dung. He did this because it was uh, small and convenient and uh, came in these nice little nuggets. So in his summary of, of the early work, one thing he points out is that there's a very predictable sequence of fungi that appear on dung. So in the first two days, you get some of these early mucromycota, things like uh, pylobolus, which I showed early on, and uh, a few others. We'll come back to pylobolus, but they show up immediately uh, on this. About two weeks later, you get their mycoparasites showing up. And then um, around the same time, we're starting to get the, the ascomycota, both the cup fungi and the, um, and the flask fungi. And then the last phase would be the mushrooms. So, the, so a question from the get-go has been, what drives this sequence? Is this really successional? And the first ideas on this were that it was a change in resources and growth rate. In particular, these early fungi that, that appeared uh, had very simple uh, sugars as their main target for food. They weren't able to break down the, the more complicated foods that um, would be contained in dung. Uh, uh, where the ascomycetes, the next one to sh show up, are able to digest the more recalcitrant forms of sugar, the cellulose. And so um, they they could uh, make their living on on this even after the the simple sugars had been removed, and then the last phase the basidiomycota uh, also had uh, access to the lignin as well as the cellulose. So this sounded like a great idea, uh, but when 
Webster looked at it experimentally, what he found was that time dysporulation alone could account for the succession. That if you took if you took these fungi out and put them on a petri dish and just grew them, you'd come up with the same sequence of timing because it just took longer for some to sporulate than others. Um, he also showed that uh, early species like Pylobolus could grow on older dung. So you could take dung after other things had gone through it, uh, sterilize it, put them back on, and they would grow just fine. Uh, and the competitive effects of most species seem to be limited to reducing the duration and quantity of fruiting. And so um, the little basidiomycetes, the coprinellus, uh, were especially effective at, at uh, suppressing fruiting of some of the some of the earlier ones. Uh, but in any case, this sequence looked looked like it wasn't really a succession. But this really is not is the end of the story at this point, but it's not really the full story because no one has yet looked at the mycelial level, which is really what's going on. All this is based on fruiting. Um, and so this is still an open story as to what goes on with fungal succession on dung. Okay, so now let's go to a part of the story that is well known and has been well known for a while, and that's how do coprophilus fungi find new dung? And the and the answer that's been known since the early 1900s is that dispersal from dung to plant material is what goes on, and then the plant material is eaten by herbivores. This is passed through their digestive system, and then when the dung is deposited, it already has the fungi in it. So this is how they get there fast. Uh, and here's a, a diagram from Buller from about the 1920s um, that shows this with um, a bunch of different types of fungi uh, targeting their spores out toward the light. I'll come back to that, shooting them. And then this would, to get away from this dung pile, sticking on plant material and then waiting there on the plant material until uh, herbivores eat them. So if we go to Pylobolus, it's sort of the poster child for this, uh, this mode of dispersal. Pylobolus is, a, is the one that showed up very early in the first couple days after the dung is deposited. It has at the top here, this little black cap is a bundle of spores. And so what's what happens is that this lower part here is explosive and fires this cap of spores for a couple meters out into the foliage. And I'll show you I'll show you this uh, in a moment. But I think what's even more impressive is that that swollen chamber is also a lens. So here's some early pictures from Buller from the, from the 1920s where he shows that you can use that lens to actually get an image of a hand or a letter th through it because it's a clear thing. Uh, but what the fungus is using that lens for is to focus the light and allow it to point directly to the light. So if it's so if the light comes in at an angle, it will reorient itself over a few minutes time. Uh, until it's pointing toward the light. And then it couples this with timing so that it fires toward the light at around 10 in the morning, which gives it a almost perfectly 45 degree angle, uh, which optimizes the distance that it would travel. And we'll go to a, a, a movie of this that uh, comes from Nick Money's lab. So here's the little pylobolus, the swollen part. You're going to see it explode right about now. And just a big blob of goo followed it. Let's do that once more. So what's going to happen with that, with that capsule is that it's going to be covered in this snotty uh, goo and stick to um, grass or foliage and then wait there patiently until a herbivore eats it and then pass through the guts and be in the next dung pile. So another one that does that um, in a similar way is, a, is an ascomycete. This is uh, a Um, And what you're looking at here 
are are interpreted as little cups. They're more like cushions in this case, but it's an apothecium. And all the little dark blobs here are ripe assai. So here is a, a, a squash mount of that. And each of these is a little ascus loaded with ascospores. We'll blow this up in the next picture here. Uh, so here's an ascus. And those two are going to point toward the light and fire this package of spores out that again is sticky and is going to stick on foliage, be eaten and pass through uh, herbivore gut. And um, another ascomycete that, that behaves in this way but looks quite different and is in a different group is the uh, podospora, which makes a little flask. So that's what you're looking at here. And inside this flask would be the assay. They would gr uh, grow out one at a time through this neck and shoot their spores, again, targeting light, um, and then headed off uh, and sticking. And then we can get to some relatives of pylobolus. This is um, phycomyces. It just has very long, uh, what are called um, sporangiophores uh, that stick this little blob of uh, spores out away from the dung and release it to the air. Those will drift off and uh, stick on foliage again and be eaten and come back out in the dung. And this one is also light sensitive. In fact, it's so light sensitive that it's become a model system for this. So this is a, a time lapse here taken at three minute intervals and you can see it growing toward the light. This is actually sensitive enough to pick up moonlight. Um, so it's it's really good at finding that if there if the dung was in some little dark patch or something, it's it's good at finding the the window where its spores would optimally be released. So here is Copernopsis, this little uh mushroom. These are very common on dung. Uh, here's one that I found uh, a couple of years ago, and you can see the uh, the spores uh, below here. How did I find this? I found this by taking uh, domestic rabbit uh, beans, putting them in a peanut butter jar with um, wet paper towels, and two weeks later, Copernopsis shows up. Uh, in fact, a lot of these pictures that I'm showing you came from from this approach, and so you can do this at home. You can take you can take any kind of herbivore dung, put it in a moist chamber like this, and you'll see this sequence yourself. Okay, so what did I just show you? I showed you that um, the coprophilus fungi to find new dung, they have this this cool way of dispersal by by uh, firing off. Uh, uh, actively shooting the spores toward targeted uh, toward light, sticking on uh, foliage. Most of these have dark spores, so they are tolerant to UV light and can probably sit on that foliage for a long time. They all have to be tolerant of digestive enzymes, right? Because if they're going to go through the animal gut, they can't be uh, digested by it, and so they're very good at that. And Many of them are stimulated to germinate by passage through the gut. In fact, almost all of the early ones have already germinated by the time the dung is deposited. So they're they're gaining that advantage of speed by taking cues from the digestive system. Okay, but there's a second way to do this. And the second way is vectoring by microinvertebrates. So this is a, a a slide that I got from Meredith Blackwell, who's done who was at the uh, Louisiana State University for many years, um, and worked with uh, a variety of, of fairly small dung fungi that most people had ignored. And what she's showing in this diagram is that some of these will make sticky spores that will stick to the legs and underside of of uh, mites that are found on the on the surface of dung, the mites themselves are phoretic, which means that they hitch a ride on other animals to the next dung. 
And so a lot of these, these phoretic mites will uh, jump onto dung beetles, and then the dung beetle will fly off to the next pile of dung. The mite gets off, crawls around, and the spores that are on it now have been dispersed to a new uh, habitat. Uh, and it, dung beetles are probably one of the main ways to move by this route, but almost anything that crawls across the dung would do this. And, and other insects like flies can also be a source for this phoretic movement. So I'll show you a few of these. Here's the um, uh, parathesia, these little uh, flask-like structures that in this case are fuzzy. This is uh, the genus Botryotrichium, which if you've seen it before, you, you might've heard of it as ketomium. Um, and if we blow those little flask shaped structures up, you can see that that fuzziness are really bristly little hairs that actually have hooks on the end. So this is kind of a microscopic cockleburr, if you will. And anything that was crawling around this surface would pick these things up and move the whole fruit body to another um, uh, dung patch. But if that didn't work, then the, then the assay in this case uh, don't shoot their spores, but they ooze them out into a, a, a sticky mass that'll stick on anything that's crawling across this dung. And so this is uh, yet another way uh, for them to move. Now, one of the cooler ones, I think, is this uh, Cathistes, which is a very early um, arriving of uh, fungus. It's a saprobic fungus, and it has a little flash-shaped fruiting body again. Here's the neck coming up. Uh, and it has sticky spores that stick to mites. These mites uh, often are phoretic on, on flies, and the flies in this case follow the moose around. <laughs> and when the moose defecates, the flies oviposit within minutes after the after the uh, new dung is deposited. And when they do that, the mites hop off uh, and colonize their new resource. And so does the uh, cathistes that they were carrying. Here's a, um, a scanning electron micrograph of the underside of a mite. And here are little cathistes or uh, pixidiophora spores in this case, another one. And here's a blow up of those. So they've got a sticky little end, and this is the underside of the mite. So these uh, often stick up and look, um, uh, have like a little super glue drop on. This is uh, Pixidiophora, which is another one of these um, phoretically dispersed dung fungi. Uh, and this, the sticky spot would be here on the, on the spore. And if we go back to our nematode trapper, uh, the stylopogy, it too has a phoretic spore stage. So here's this little sticky spore that it makes. Here's its hyphae with, a, with the um, amoebae stuck to it again. But what's especially interesting here is that even the amoebae have a phoretic spore stage. And so both the uh, uh, the host of the stylopagy and the stylopagy often move on the same mite to a new uh, to a new dung pile. Okay, so the take home points about uh, fungal communities on dung that I just showed you were that the community is fueled by the plant biomass, um, and this dung supports diverse communities of fungi from all the major fungal groups. These communities develop rapidly in a predictable sequence of fruiting, but we don't really know whether that's succession yet. Um, and there are multiple tropic levels involved. There are saprobes, parasites, predators, et cetera. There's two main routes for dispersal. One is via spores that are uh, shot off onto plants and then ingested, or that are, uh, the second route is to be uh, vectored by invertebrate vectors. So with that, we come to an end for this section of the um, uh, fungal communities on dung, and I'll open it up to questions.